Hey everybody, I want to remind you of the different ways that you could send your tithes and your offering. You could do it through texting. If you don't have access to Google Play or the App Store, just send a text to 601-273-4609 and send it to the word GIVE. After that, you'll receive a text message back and then just follow the simple instructions, the simple steps, and you're all set up. Also, you can use the Tidely app. Just download the app from the Google Play or the App Store and you can set up the amount that you want to give and you can send it to Springs of Praise World Outreach Center or you can mail it to Post Office Box 549, Crystal Springs, Mississippi 39059. If you want to drop it off at the uh, church office, the office is open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And as always, I want to thank you for watching this program. Would you give him a hand, Justin Blankenship? Hey, man. Hey, Boston's about to go to sleep. I was going to show him off. But you, you stand, you, you can keep holding him, Sharon. There's Mr. Boston. He'll be, yeah, turn him around. There you go. He'll be, he'll be four months old in a few days. Somebody asked me, was he planned? And I said, well, the... The dates weren't planned very well. Benjamin is birthday's December 4th, and Boston's is December 15th. So, and then we have Christmas. So, if anybody wants to send a love offering around <laughs> November, you're welcome to do that. We need it. Amen. It is good to be here today. It is. Um, somebody was laughing at the church. They said, so you get a, are you getting a week off? And I said, no, I'm going to preach. But we usually have two services, so I'm only preaching one today. So, I do feel like I'm getting a little bit of a... Of a break. Uh, God is doing great things at our church, and uh, I, I love just giving, it, he gets all the credit because the truth is we're not doing anything. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing trying to get people there, and I, I mean that. Um, we're, we've been amazed at, at, at lately, just a few weeks ago, um, you know, we, I, I decided that we're going to, if people want to get saved this Sunday, they're going to come down to the front. Not, I mean, a lot of times we people raise their hands, but I said, I, I said, if you feel bold enough to receive salvation, I want you to come down to two services. Between the two services, we had 17 people walk the aisle to say, I want to get saved today. And I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And I just thought, wow, who are these people? I mean, they're, they're not just standing in the back saying a little prayer. They were, they were walking out to dedicate their life. And uh, we do have a lot of uh, great things. The, the, the first service, we have a men's center, a 90-day program. I've been going out there on Monday nights. It's called Rob's Ranch. I go out there on Monday nights to speak, and I've been doing that for about eight or nine years. And so they bring the guys. During COVID, they quit coming, and some of the church people got mad at me because they thought I'd ask them to leave. And I said, and so I said, I told the guys at Rob's Ranch, I said, you got to come back because these people are screaming at me because they think I've made you leave. And I, and so, because people have wondered, you know, how do people react to your church? And our people love all these people that come. In our second service, we have a Hope Center, Women's Hope Center. It's an eight month to year long discipleship program. We've got about 26 women in it right now. And uh, so we get to baptize people all the time. I had a young lady the other day that um, they, we have people that go out and give devotions. And one of the ladies went out and gave a devotion. And she came and talked to me later. And she said, this one young lady, uh, test, not testified, but she admitted to something after it was over. She got saved that day. She said, I want to get saved. And she grabbed that lady and said, come in here. And took her out to the garage area. And she said, um, she had a bed sheet. She said, I was about to end my life out here and hang myself. And she said, somebody walked in. They didn't know what I was doing. I didn't tell them. They didn't see me. But I, I walked into this garage with the intention of ending my life. And they walked in. And, and they, they, I heard them. So I stopped what I was doing. And she said, and then today you've presented the gospel and I want to get saved. And on Sunday, I got to baptize her this last Sunday and God came to life. So we are seeing God do some miraculous things and, and just seeing God heal and set free and just stuff on a, on a regular basis. And once again, God gets the glory. We're not doing anything special. I'm not, um, I, I laugh and tell people I wouldn't walk across the street to hear myself preach and just to have people come and drive in to, to be a part of the service. It is a God thing. And I'm just very grateful and thankful for that. It worked out for us this Sunday, um, Southwestern Christian University, where I, the reason I left here to go to college, um, they were coming down this Sunday. They come once a year and do our worship. And, and sometimes I preach and sometimes they speak, but they come down once a year. So they were already coming this time. And so uh, we knew the rest of the year is kind of busy, the summer and stuff like that. So we we just thought it was a good weekend to be able to come and let you see um, 
myself and Sarah, but we understand who's more important, that uh, you get to see Benjamin and you get to meet Boston for the first time. We were excited about that. So anyway, thankful for um, our opportunity and just grateful for my family, all that God is doing in us and through us. So if you don't mind this morning, if you'll stand, if you got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't have any idea. Well, let me back up and say this. Dad and I were talking Christmas, and he did tell me a little bit of what he'd been talking about, but I didn't think about any of it. And God's been kind of having me on this journey, especially on Wednesday nights, teaching. And it, it literally goes right along with what Dad has been saying. And I may even say some of the things he said, but um, how many of you know sometimes it takes us two or three times to hear things before it really gets into us. So I want to talk to you this morning from Luke chapter 3, just two verses of scripture, very familiar story here, verse 21, Luke chapter 3, verse 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in, who, in you I am well pleased. Father, we just thank you for this time together. And Lord, I just pray that you speak to our hearts and our minds. And Lord, today, help us to leave here changed and transformed. Father, we walked in here wanting to leave different. We don't want to leave the same way we came in here. We want to leave here knowing who we are called to be. We want to leave here knowing, Father, that, that you are for us and that, Lord, you are fighting our battles. So, Father, I just pray that, Lord, if somebody walked in here hopeless, may they leave here full of hope today. If they walked in here not knowing you, may they leave here knowing a Savior that loves them. Father, today, may we leave more full of your Holy Spirit to live the life you have called us to live. So we give you these few moments together, gathered around your word. We gather around the table of the Lord. And Father, as we do, may we just hear your words to us today that also give us the boldness and the courage to live that life. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Ghost and all God's people together said, Amen. 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 Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm glad I get to sit by you and you may be seated. There are two places in the life of Jesus that the Father speaks audibly over him. The first one is what we just read, that Jesus is baptized. And as he goes under the water and comes up, the heavens open and a voice comes down from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father speaks audibly over him. The second one, and I'll explain the importance of these two in a moment, but the second one was later on toward the end of the ministry of Jesus. It's what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus goes on the mountain, and he's there, and with Peter, James, and John, and they meet two people up there, Elijah and Moses. They meet the law and the prophets. That's what they represent. And here is Christ standing with the law and the prophets, and Peter's up there talking. Peter's doing what he's good at, and Peter's just running his mouth, and he said, man, this is so wonderful. Let's build three tents. Let's live here and the father literally speaks from heaven and, he, and this is what he kind of says if you read into the text and this is just my opinion but he says this is my beloved son Peter quit running your mouth and listen to him he does say this is my beloved son listen to him so those two moments Jesus is speaking or the father is speaking over Jesus and the reason the first one is important it's because Jesus is about to start his ministry. You know the story of Jesus. Here he is. He's born. And then at, we understand at 12 years old, they go to the temple. And Mary and Joseph lose Jesus for three days. If you ever thought you were a bad parent, if you never lost your child for three days, you're doing pretty good. I mean, can you imagine? They, they haven't lost any child. They lost the Messiah. I mean, how? I mean, you're like, man, this is scary. Like, we know this is Jesus. You, you didn't just lose little Timmy over there. You've lost the Messiah. I mean, angels don't normally tell people you're going to have a child, and then all of a sudden you've lost him. But Jesus 
And they find him in the temple and he's talking to the wise and, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And he's saying to them, uh, and asking them questions. And then finally Mary and Joseph take him. And in Luke 2.52 it's very interesting because Jesus, here he is, the God man. He is 100% God, 100% man, both at the same time. But he submits himself to his parents. And when he does, the Bible says he grows in wisdom and stature in favor with God and with man. And from 12 to 30, we know nothing about his life. It's the lost years of Jesus. We don't know exactly what he's doing but at 30 years old he comes on the scene and John the Baptist looks at him and says behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world and then he baptizes him and the father speaks over him because Jesus is about to go into the wilderness for 40 days he's about to, to, to see the temptation unfold before him and I'll be honest with you all these years I've read the Bible I always thought that the temptation of Jesus that for 40 days Jesus is hanging out and he's just you know having a good time he's hungry because he hasn't eaten but he's hanging out with animals and just sitting out in the desert and at the very end Satan tempts him but if you read it it says for 40 days Satan tempted him we have the, the record of the last part of that but for 40 days Satan is tempting him and the reason the father speaks over Jesus is because of what Satan was trying to attack. What Satan was trying to attack in Jesus was one thing, his identity. His identity. What did, what did Satan say to Jesus? He said, if you be the Son of God, turn those, that stone to bread. If you be the Son of God, jump down off this place and the angels will catch you. Listen, you don't, I, he was saying, you are the Son of God, but you don't have to go through all the steps. If you'll just bow down and worship me, I will give you these kingdoms right now. He is attacking his identity. And the Father speaks over him before he goes into that to say, listen, you you are my beloved son in whom I will please. You're going to need those words over the next 40 days. Because 40 days, the, sa the Satan, Satan in the, in, the, in the story, is going to accuse you over and over and over. And he's going to try to get at your identity. And then, right before Jesus goes to the cross, he stands before Pilate. And what does Pilate say to him? Are you who they say you are? Are you the king of the Jews? identity and Jesus says yes it's true but right before that the father spoke over him and said you are my beloved son listen to him in other words Jesus you're about to go to the cross and just like you needed words spoken over you before you went to the temptation you need words spoken over you because you are about to be tested with the cross and your identity is about to be tested listen Jesus could have called on angels at any moment to say take me out of this I'm done but he goes to the cross and he goes to the suffering and he dies but he raised, he's raised again. Why? He did that because I believe the Father had spoke over him and said, you are my beloved son. You are the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. You, your identity is this. And so the Bible says, Philippians 2 says, that Jesus submitted himself and humbled himself to death, even death on the cross. And because of that, the Father has given him the name that is above every name, that at that name every knee shall bow. At that that name every tongue shall confess. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. He is identity. He was Jesus the Christ. Christ isn't His last name. Christ is His title. He is the anointed one. He is Jesus the anointed one. And Satan came to attack His identity. And I believe 2,000 years later Satan is still attacking people's identity. I believe what Satan wants is for you not to know who you are. Not to get real political this morning, but I'll be honest, the reason there is so much confusion in our world, the reason the enemy wants to bring confusion to gender, to sexuality, to other things, is because if the enemy can get you to question who you are, then you never step into the destiny and the purpose God has for you because you're over here and you don't even know who you are. You don't even know exactly what you're called to be. You're confused about all these things. And the enemy operates in chaos and confusion. And the reason the, our 
identities are being plastered everywhere right now is because the enemy is trying to get us to question even the foundation of who we are, male, female, who we are, sexuality, all of those things. The enemy wants us to be confused because if we live in confusion, then we never step. And it's time the church rises up and says, no, we know who you were created to be. Before you were ever thought of, God had already created you. He, he put you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made and that your soul knows right well because the enemy wants to come for our identity. The enemy wants to destroy our identity and he wants to take us to a place where we don't know who and whose we are. Amen? Amen. But when you begin to understand your identity, I want to read to you today a couple of scriptures. This is from John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus says this, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. This is the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and, and will be in you. And then Jesus says this, I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. I will not leave you orphans. The word there is orphanos in the Greek. And it literally means I will not abandon you. And here's what I think. I think for too long, the church, many people, and I've been doing a teaching on Wednesday nights on healing the orphan spirit. Because I believe for too long, people have been real. Listen, there are natural orphans in this world. That I, I was with a guy just this week, a pastor of, of a, one of our largest churches, the first church in the, in the Pentecostal Holiness Church in North Carolina. And I was in, in Atlanta, Georgia this week in, in bylaws meetings, sat right across from him. And this, this, this man grew up not knowing who his dad was. He grew up in the foster care system. He grew up and he said, I was an orphan. The, the guy that he, he calls his dad is a, is a pro golfer. And so we were talking about all of that, how in different ways he was raised. He said, this is who calls me his he calls me, he pops, or I call him pops. He, he says he's my dad. But this man was naturally orphaned. We understand in the natural that is the case. But I believe just like there's natural orphans, I also believe there are spiritual orphans. And I believe what happens is there are many people that live with a, with a heart. They love God, but they never fully step into the identity God has for them because the enemy has lied to them and told them you're not good enough and you can never do it. If you're a natural orphan today, I don't mean this, I don't want to bring up bad memories, but the truth is this, a natural orphan will try to work harder because yeah. they want to find the love and the acceptance. Mm -hmm. And if, I'm, if, I, if, I, if I present myself well enough, somebody will adopt me. Do you realize we have people all the time that think if they're good enough, God will love them. If they work hard enough, God will love them. If I can just do all this stuff, God will love me. And the truth is this, when you're doing all those things, many times you're not really fulfilling the destiny God has for you because you're so busy just trying to get God to love you that God says, I love you. I've never not loved you. I care about you. And when God begins to heal that spot of your heart, then you really step into your identity because you realize who you are and you realize what God came to do. Jesus said, I will not abandon abandoned you 2,000 years ago he went to the cross and he died and on the cross he says my God, my God, why have you abandoned, why have you forsaken me, he took abandonment on him so that we don't have to live that way any longer so now I don't have to think I've been abandoned but I've got the power of the Holy Ghost living on the inside of me and he can heal our hearts, he can heal our souls and now I can step into my true identity, the Jesus said the Holy Spirit is coming, and He is going to, number one, be with you. You're not abandoned. He is with you. But then, number two, He's going to live in you. You realize when you got saved, and when you got the Holy Spirit, you did not get the junior Holy Spirit. You understand? I love, I, I like, I like food, you can tell. And I like, I like bacon. And I like, I like to go to Wendy's in our town, because they have this, you know, if, I, if I'm on a diet, I'll get the junior bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> it's going to clog my arteries slower <laughs> than that baconator that I like. Yeah. It's just got flavor after flavor of bacon. You know what? Whenever you received the Holy Ghost, you didn't get the junior Holy Spirit. Amen. You received the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you. You didn't get a little bit of it. You didn't get a small dose of it. You got the 
The same Spirit that was there raising Jesus. The same Spirit that was brooding over creation. You've got that Spirit living on the inside of you. And so now I can walk in my identity. I can heal my abandoned heart. I don't have to live with these things. I can step into my identity and who God has called me to be. Because the Holy Spirit came to heal me. He came to empower me. He came to set me free and transform me. And He came to live on the inside of me. So everywhere I go, I carry the Holy Ghost with me. Everywhere I go, I got the greatest power living on the inside of me. And I realize I don't have to be orphaned any longer. I don't have to be confused about my identity. But I can step into what God has for me because He is the one who says what I am, not the world. Amen? Amen. For too long, we get caught up in, who are you? And we'll say, I'm a plumber. I'm a doctor. I'm a preacher. No, no, no. That's what you do. That's right. But who are you? Yeah. Who true. are you? Yeah. Not what do you do. Who are you? I live in this place. No, not where you live. Who are you? And the question is this, when God gets us to a place, I believe in my own heart, this might sound weird, but the Lord just showed me this as I was preaching last Sunday. Matter of fact, I didn't even say it in the first service. He showed it to me during the, at the end of the first service. We have people in our church that do like homeless ministry, do prison ministry right down the road from our churches is the one prison in Oklahoma where every single prisoner, I don't care what the felony, I mean, I don't care what, the, what has happened, whether it's a one felony or if it's you're a mass murderer, everybody goes through that prison. It's, it's the, recessment center, the reception center. They literally receive every single prisoner. They go through their do medical checks. They do everything, and they send them out to different prisons. So everybody goes to that prison. And we've got a team of people that, that partner with Prison Fellowship Ministries, and they go out there all the time and do that. I love it. I go out there and preach when I can. We have people that do homeless ministry. I go up there when I can. I love all that. But I feel like this. I've always wondered, Lord, why? What, what is it? I love those things, and I think we need them, and I, I support them. We give money, and I go help when I can. But that's not been my lane as far as the biggest thing I do. And I felt like last week, the Lord spoke to me and said this. He said, son, I have called you to be a clarion voice to the church. You're a son of the church. You've been raised in the church. And I am trying to wake up the church yeah. to realize yeah. the church has got to stand up yeah. and realize who they are called to be. Yeah. So I am yeah. taking it on my assignment. And this is my first place to visit. I am taking yeah. it as an assignment that, yeah. yes, I've been raised in the church. But listen to me. The, the prodigal son, he didn't know his identity. So he went out and he messed up and he did all these things because the prodigal son did not know who he was. So he's walking back and he's rehearsing to the Father. Father, forgive me. If, let me be a, a hired servant. Just let me live in the servant's quarters. Father, I'm sorry. And before he can get one word out of his mouth, the Father picks up his skirt and he begins to run. Sorry, guys. He picked up his, whatever you want to call that thing. I don't know. His robe, I guess. He picked up his robe, his skirt. And he runs to the Son. And before the Son can say anything, he says, bring the, bring the best robe, bring his, bring his ring, bring his shoes, kill the fatted calf. My son, listen, the prodigal son had lost his identity in the pig pen. He had that moment of clarity where the light bulb went off and he said, my father's servants had it better than I do. And he realized who he was. And the reason the father said, you're not a hired servant, you're, here's why, because of his DNA, because of who he was. You can't live over there in that house. you got to live in our house because you are mine. So. Yes. But listen, we love to preach on that, and I love it. And we talk about the prodigals coming home. But do you realize the elder brother didn't know his identity either? That's right. The elder brother stayed close to the home, but he missed it just as much as the prodigal son did. The elder brother missed it just as much. And I can tell you in my life, I'm a, I'm a product of this church. I'm a product of the church. Uh, I, I, I tell stories all the time. I told a story the other day about me waking up right over there when we had pews. And it was dark in here. And I woke up. And if you remember wrestling, I was like the undertaker. I just sat right up. And I looked, and nobody was in this building. It was pitch black dark, and I began to cry. And I looked in the door, and at that moment, my dad, who had thought my mama had taken me home, and she didn't, and he got home and realized I was not there. And he walks through that door. That's why I have abandonment issues. Thank you, Dad. He never said, I will not abandon you. Jesus said that. He didn't. He walks in here and picks me up, and he takes me home. I'll never forget that. I literally said that in a sermon just the other day. Listen, I'm a product of the church. I'm a product. I've been in church my whole life, 41 years and nine months. I've been in church a long time. 
But listen to me. We are in these days in a, in a time where we've got to get serious about what God is doing. And I believe two things about the revival that is coming. Number one, Doug Small, who this the prayer Gene is talking about. Doug Small is a Church of God bishop that we have uh, brought into the IPHC to lead us in prayer gatherings, doing an amazing job. And Doug Small says this. Don't, mis don't misunderstand these words. But he said the harvest that is coming will be the dirtiest harvest in human history. In other words, God is going to save people. And by dirty, I don't mean that in a bad way toward people. What I'm saying is this. God is going to save people. And people are coming in the church that nobody's wanted anything to do with. And that's my prayer at our church. God, we, I pray all the time in front of my church. God, give us the ones nobody else wants. Give us the ones everybody's rejected. Give us the ones nobody can. Listen, David can take those men that the world had rejected. And when David gets done, he's got a mighty army. He's got a man that'll go down in a pit and kill a lion on a snowy day. God, give us those. The people that are coming in, they might not look like you and I. They might not act like you and I. They might not smell like you and I. But the harvest that is coming. But listen, the Bible says this, that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who dug down down deep in the dirt and he found the pearl. He found the, the jewel that was there, the treasure that was there. He had to dig in the dirt. And I believe the harvest that is coming in, it may be dirty, but we've got to roll our sleeves up. We've got to dig in the dirt and find the diamond that is in there. We've got to find the diamond in people and realize they have a true identity. God loves them and He cares about them. And the second part is I believe the revival that is coming is going to be full of people who step into their true identity. And I believe the revival that is coming are people who understand, excuse me, who understand what God has called them to be. Yeah, Listen to this in Romans. This is out of the Passion Paraphrase. It says this, Romans 8, 14, The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. I love this. You did not receive the spirit of religious duty. Leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance. Enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel, feel orphaned. For as he rises up within us. Our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection. Beloved father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us. As he whispers into our innermost being. You are God's beloved child. When you begin, I believe Jesus came to restore our identity. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God tells Adam something. Adam, I'm calling you to have dominion over the fish, over the air, over creation. You are to have dominion. For if, if you're lazy today, you don't want to hear this, but work was not a result of the fall of sin. Adam was called to work before he ever fell into sin. Yeah. God calls Adam and he says, I've given you a task. Not just to name the animals. He was given everything you need. To read, I'm going to read it today. Read Genesis 1 and 2. God says there's, there's gold, there's precious jewels, there's water. Everything, I believe Adam and Eve were created to, create, to help humanity be everything God was destiny and creating it to be. And he had given them the resources to create a place where humanity could thrive. I believe that was the, the original intention with Eden. It wasn't just for Adam and Eve to be there by themselves. God says be fruitful and multiply. Create this place that where humanity can thrive, can be everything God has called them to be. So they were called to rule and to reign. Now, that's the first two chapters of the Bible. Read the last two chapters of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, guess what happens? And behold, I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of the sky. Once again, I think we have the first Eden messed up. We think Adam and Eve are just hanging out, chilling, relaxing. Uh, he's mowing the grass every once in a while, and they're just enjoying all this stuff. No, Adam and Eve were called to have dominion, to rule, and to reign, and to work. So then, the very end, I think we have heaven wrong. And pardon this, if, if, but I, I love the song Amazing Grace. I love it. We, you know, seeing it, amazing grace in the very end. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Sitting over here as a little boy, my thought was, we are going to be singing God's praise for 10,000 years? That's going to, man, that's going to be kind of a lot. I, I can't do this for 10,000 minutes. And you want me to do this for 10,000 years? Listen, I love worship. I love praise and worship, so I don't mean this bad. But I don't believe we're going to be standing around singing for eternity. 
I believe John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And then in chapter 22, God says this, that they will reign with me forever. We are going to reign through eternity. We are still going to have work to do. And the reason I'm telling you is this, because in, in, in between those two. So we start with the, with, the, with the beginning with ruling and reigning. We end with ruling and reigning. But in Romans, Paul says that those that, I, that have been saved will rule and reign even in this life. I believe we are called to take our place of our identity, to realize who we are by ruling and reigning. I don't, that language makes us sound like we're mean to people. We are, we're authoritative people know Jesus said it this way he said the Gentiles lord it over people but not you he said you are called to serve and the, the, the least will be the greatest and the greatest will be the least my point is this when you understand your identity you step into a new place of serving God where you realize your life was created for a reason you are not created to suck air and to die one day and to pay taxes in between you were created for a reason with a purpose and a destiny and when you begin to live life on purpose, you begin to realize, I go to my job, but that's just to pay my bills. That's not my purpose and my destiny. But while I'm there, I'm going to love, and I'm going to serve, and I'm going to pray for, and I'm going to make a difference. You begin to realize that God has called you to have an identity, that God has called you. And listen to me, how are we going to change our world? It's not, it's not, you're not going to do it by griping on Facebook all the time. You're not going to change your world. Listen, I'm not trying to mean to you, but just a few people read those negative comments that you got, okay? It's not going to change the world. You're not going to change the world by just always being upset about everything. You know how you're going to change the world? By getting out and letting your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your Father which is in heaven. Light doesn't make much room and make much sense in this room right now. Put a light in here, who cares? The lights are on. But you get it dark in here and that light begins to matter. Salt on top of salt doesn't mean anything. But you get a bland piece of meat and you throw some salt on there and it makes a difference. We are called to be the light of the world. We are called to be the salt of the earth. We are called to step into our identity and be who God has called us to be. We are called to rule and to reign, not just, not just in the end. We are called to do it right now. And Jesus comes to fulfill everything that Adam messed up. And I believe the second Adam, Jesus comes, and his death, and his burial and his resurrection makes it possible for us to have a new identity. Now I can be who God has called me to be. Now I can step into that identity. Now I can understand whose I am. And because of that, my life matters. I'm almost done. We're going to pray for people this morning. Karen, would you come play or somebody in the worship team? Would you come? I'm almost finished. When the Father speaks, and I might have said this before, but it's been a while since so I preached here, but when when the Father speaks over Jesus the first time, He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you realize Jesus had not, that we know of, done one miracle? He hadn't walked on water. He hadn't turned water into wine. He hadn't healed one blind eye that we have record of. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son, not because of what He was doing, but because of who he was. And I want you to know this. Listen, for too long, it's funny, my, 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 my parents and even this church didn't raise me to be this way. But I just grew up with this thing inside where I, I was the most judgmental. I remember 11 years old telling my cousin he was going to hell. And he said, you're the most judgmental 11-year-old I've ever met in my life. He was 10. I was 11. But I grew up with this mentality of holding things against people. Well, you messed up. You did this. You blew it. And I live with a place of judgment. When I was in college, it's embarrassing to think about. I once made it, I was the, I was the RA, which means I was in charge of making sure when nobody else was there, me and one of the guy, making sure all the students were there. We had a young man that lived about 45 minutes from the school. He goes home for the weekend, forgets, forgets to sign out, calls up there and says, I forgot to sign out. Can you sign me out? I said, no. Here's the rules. I made him drive 45 minutes back. I only got two days on a weekend pass. Drive 45 minutes back to the school to sign out. His dad was not happy with me. And then drive all the way back because I was good at the law. You do this. You messed up. You blew it. You better keep the law. 
And I was good at that. And what I'm telling you is this. What God has been working on me for years now. I'll never forget sitting at Rob's Ranch with these men. The first time I went, I was scared to death. I met a guy the other day. I didn't know how long I've been going out there, but I met a guy, Sarah and I met a guy at Target the other day in Norman. And he said, I, 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 I talked to him. He said, your first night out there was my first day there. And he said, that was nine years ago. This September will be nine years. And I told him, I said, I was scared to death. I was in a room full of guys, and I, I've, I'd never done any of the things they had done. I didn't know how they would receive me, and I was terrified. I was scared of what to say. I grew up in the church. I grew up in a, in a very, um, you know, in, in a, I mean, a great life, but I grew up very naive about things. I grew up very sheltered about things. And I didn't know about any of this stuff. I didn't, know, I didn't know what to say to anybody. But I can tell you this, and I, and I don't mean this bad. If you have a, I deal with people on a daily basis that have a past, and please do not misunderstand what I'm fixing to say. But this is how judgmental I was. I just assumed people that messed up were probably not very good people. If I'm being honest, they're just not good people. And what the Lord has brought me to a place of now, I've never done a drug in my life, but the greatest ministry I have in my church are dealing with people that are literally God is breaking chains of addiction off their life. I have a young man that I'm discipling on a regular basis who is the best golfer in our town. He has the course record, but alcohol specifically and even drugs has captured had captured his life where he would have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to drink just so he would be steady enough to go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. And, and, and now on a regular basis, he's been sober a year, clean and sober a year, and I am discipling him on a regular basis. What what God has taught me is this. These people that you were having something against, the truth, I didn't have them against them, but the people you looked at, the truth is this. They're not bad people. They need the transforming love of Jesus. But listen, let me say this to you as nice as I can. I feel the same way about church folks sometimes. I love Jesus, but sometimes his friends get on my nerves. His kids can bother me. Because you know what? We can, we can be in church our whole life and we can act like, hey, I, I'm good. I've been here all my life. I don't need all that. Listen to me. You can have an orphan heart and be in church your whole life right. as much as you can have an orphan heart and never go to church. Because the truth is this. Church folks, they need Jesus. And sometimes we need to be reminded even more than other people. You realize when God saves people out of things, they remember the hell they came out of. They remember what God brought them out of. If you've been in church 20 years, you can forget what God's done for you. You can forget all the things God's done. And we need reminded. And what God is doing in these last days is healing the orphan hearts in the church and the unchurched people. Both of them realizing we need Him to heal us. We both need I need to be reminded on a daily basis of what it means to walk in my identity. And not just being in church will never save me. Just being good enough is never going to get there. I need Him every single day. I don't care. And I've done plenty of wrong things. I'm not trying to paint myself as a saint. What I'm saying to you is this. Just because you've been in church doesn't mean you don't need this. And just because you haven't been in church in a long time doesn't mean, listen to me, we all need to realize God is bringing us together because I believe He wants to bring a revival that will sweep this world, that will change our communities, that will see things happen, but we've got to let God heal our orphan heart so we begin to realize we both need Him more than anything. And our identity is not in who, what we do. Our identity is not in what we have. Our identity is not in all these things of the world, what house we live in, what car we drive. Our identity is simply found in who he is and whose he is. And when I let him heal me, I begin to realize this. I am seated with him in heavenly places. I'll end with this. Mephibosheth, you know the story. He falls down and he's dropped. Something he didn't do, something that was done to him. He's dropped and he breaks his legs. And when David finally finds him, he lays on his face and says, I'm a dead dog. And David says, get up from there. And David restores Mephibosheth to his rightful place at the table. You realize Mephibosheth is paralyzed and he can't, he can't walk. But when he sits at the table, every, all people see is everybody seated there. They don't see his past. They don't see things that have been done to him. All they see is he is a child 
of this kingdom. And that's why it sits there. And I don't care what your past is today. I don't care what you've done. When you come to know Jesus, you are seated with Him in heavenly places. And when people see, they don't see your mistakes. They don't see your faults. But guess what, church folks? They don't see your goodness either. All they see is you are a child of the King. And we are all on a level playing field. We are all there together, seated shoulder to shoulder, realizing we are in this thing together. We all need to step into our identity. But some of you, the devil has lied to you. Some of you, the devil has whispered in your ear and says, you're not good enough. You'll never do it. Some of you, the devil's whispered in your ear and said, you're pat God's passed you by. Your time is up. Some of you, the devil's lied and said, because of mistakes of the past, you'll never be used by God again. And God just sent me today to remind you of who you are. And when you begin to realize that God is not done with you, that God is not finished with you, that God is not done with your story, He's still writing it. You know what? When we read books a lot of times, the, the authors go out of their way to make sure the beginning of the books are good. You read that, the beginning is good. And then later on in the book, you think, man, this is kind of, they, they used all the good stuff because they wanted to get you hooked up front. You know what I love about God? He saves the best. For last. And I believe that your stories at the end of your life can be greater than the stories at the beginning of your life. That God is still writing the chapters. God is not done. And when your book is finished, the end of it is better than the beginning. They, they said, Jesus, you say, they told the man, you say the best wine for last. Because when God gets done, he always, it gets better and better and better. And I believe in our lives, the best is still yet to come. But we got to trust him and we got to step into that identity of who he has called us to be would you stand up this morning i want to simply ask you this <clears throat> i just want to pray for some folks i want some people to help me and i've seen god do some amazing things at these altars in my 41 years of life i've seen people heal set free I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at 11 years old, standing right there. So I know what God can do. And the old song says this, it is no secret what God can do. What He's done for others, He will do for you with arms wide open. He welcomes you. Listen, God is welcoming you this morning. And this morning, if you need to step into your identity, you say, I'm a Christian, but I, just, I, I need to be reminded of who I am. This morning, God wants to take those shackles off your ears. I know it's a weird place for shackles, but that's where many times the devil puts those chains right there because they block us from hearing the voice of the Lord. The world says you're not good enough. The world says you don't know who you are. Let me confuse you a little bit. Let's bring in some confusion. The devil says you're not good enough if you be the son of God, if you think you are who you are. But there's a voice that is louder if you'll listen. And it is rising above every other voice. And it is saying, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. I'm pleased in you. Not because of what you do, but simply who I created you to be. You created the image of God. And today, I believe for this church to be everything. You know what a pastor needs? I would say this whether he's my dad or not. You know what a pastor needs? People who know their identity. Who can help make a difference and reach this community. Think about if a church. Listen, I love praying for people. But you know what? We need people in the church that can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. The pastor, God, God, hears, God hears you just as much as he hears us. We need people that are out in the community loving and making a difference. If we're going to change our communities, it's not going to happen by one person. It's going to happen because a church understands their assignment and they understand who God has called them to be. And they begin to live on assignment and they begin to live on purpose. And when you have that, all of a sudden God does. So this morning, if you say, I want to step into my identity, maybe you feel you've had that orphan heart. Maybe you feel like things have abandoned you. Maybe you feel like the church has abandoned you. Or you feel like in general, you feel like they passed me by. Maybe you feel like life and people have abandoned you. This morning, God wants to heal your heart and let you realize you are His. So this morning, if you want to just come and stand, I want to lay hands on you today and see God do some work in your life. Amen. Would you come and just stand down here and let us pray for you today.